Hi, Callum Brown for 74XX. Today I'm adding six mostly big box games to my PC collection, spanning multiple eras from DOS to Windows XP. Let's take a look. First up, we have Phantasmagoria, published by Sierra in 1995, Roberta Williams' classic CD-ROM horror game. The front has stickers that indicate DOS, Windows 3.1, and Windows 95 are all supported and delivered on seven CD-ROMs. The mature rating is also stuck on, possibly because the ESRB was only formed months prior. The whole box is splattered in raised red ink blood, and the back shows some questionable screenshots and some worryingly empty rooms for an adventure game. The system specs ask for a minimum of DOS 5.0 and a 486 at 25 megahertz, and surprisingly, the game includes support for the Roland MT32, which was quite outdated in 1995, but the game also supports general MIDI. I think with these specs we can get it working on the AO486 core for the Mr. FPGA. Inside we find the manual which is black and white with red highlights. There's a reference card that explains that Windows is a resource hog and you might have better luck in DOS. In fact, in additional system requirements it asks for a 486 66MHz processor which was not mentioned on the outside of the box. There's also this time capsule of an interaction magazine flyer warning you don't let the CD-ROM revolution pass you by. Besides advertising the magazine, there's also offers for free CD-ROMs including great restaurants, wineries and breweries, PC911 and color clip art. We also have a very large registration card and an interesting pamphlet for an online service I've never heard of called Imagination. Finally, we have the CDs themselves and all seven are accounted for. I'm going to image the first CD and see if it will run on AO486 on the Mr. FPGA. Mr. FPGA is an open source software project that lets you deploy system cores onto a small affordable FPGA adorned computer called a DE10 Nano, and one of those cores is called AO486, simulating a 486 PC at up to 90 MHz. My Mr. is housed in a custom 3D printed case and features an integrated keyboard, a Roland MT32 emulator known as MT32 Pi, and a beverage holder. I have an entire video on this custom integration on my channel, check it out. I tried running this on Mr. and the AO486 core, but ran into some issues I'll talk about at the end of this segment. But for now, I'll skip over to the Dell XPS R400, which is a Pentium 2 400 MHz with 512 MB of RAM and a Radeon 9250, not that the video card will matter for this game. Never get tired of that intro. I had already installed the game at some point, so I tried just running it, but... Are you ready to face the horror of Phantasmagoria? Okay. Ooh! Terrifying. Okay, I'll start fresh. The setup has a system test built in, and it passed everything except the CPU test, but it was just unable to figure out what my CPU was. So it installed find anyway. Then the game launched, but it was in a tiny frame on the screen. Checking the README, you have to manually set the Windows desktop resolution to 640x480. The game features a lot of digitized video clips using a compression method that just leaves out every other horizontal line, which is a bit distracting at first, but you get used to it. The entire game uses pre-rendered 3D backgrounds like Mist before it, but with green screened actors carrying out the story. Unlike previous adventure games from Sierra, this one has no verbs, you just click on items to use them or look at them as the game decides. There's also a hint button prominently displayed as a red skull who is a narrator of sorts in the lower left. I've been meaning to check out this game forever, and to be honest, I wish I hadn't read recent reviews. It seems its place in history is more firmly attached to its scale and innovation rather than its actual gameplay. I mentioned problems playing on Mister. Basically the game runs great except the digital sound is distorted and audio is missing from the cinematics. Interestingly, the DOS version of the game only has support for the basic sound blaster, which is mono, not stereo. 
I did get to at least try out the Roland MT32 version of the score, which is fine, but nothing amazing. Next we have Tomb Raider from Eidos Interactive in 1996 in the iconic trapezoid gatefold box. And it's just plastered with review blurbs absolutely everywhere. System requirements are good old Pentium, 60 megahertz required and 90 megahertz recommended. Inside we have the manual, nothing to write home about here. It's apparent this is a later release since there is an insert advertising the strategy guide as well as an upgrade to the 3D accelerated version of the game, supporting many early 3D cards like the Diamond Monster 3D and Creative 3D Blaster PCI. Next, a catalog of Eidos games including Tomb Raider 2, Death Trap, Dungeon, and Daikatana. Finally, we have the game disc, but behind that we can find a cardboard cutout of Lara Croft and some bullet holes spelling out, You've been warned! I couldn't find anything in a quick Google search, so I don't know if this was part of every release. This game should work nicely in my Dell XPS R400. Installation was quick and easy in Windows 98 SE with sound card auto detection. The game uses the same trick for video compression that Phantasmagoria did with the vertical resolution cut in half. Thankfully, gameplay is smooth and bright, and it's pretty amazing to see this sort of quality on a Pentium 2 without any 3D acceleration, since I don't have a compatible card. I found the controls and camera to be a little laggy by today's standards, but as the first successful third-person action game like this, it still holds up, and you can draw straight lines from this game to modern favorites like the Uncharted series. Rise of the Dragon was released in 1990 by Dynamics, which claims to be part of the Sierra family. The title seems to be the first and only title in the Blade Hunter mystery series, no doubt trying to play off Blade Runner. The back shows the game doubles down on the Blade Runner vibe, taking place in 2053 Los Angeles in the Age of Decay. It claims to feature hand-painted 256 color graphics, but this version at least is only 16 color for IBM and various compatibles. This game also supports MT32, Adlib, and Sound Blaster, making it a great candidate for AO486 and Mr. FPGA. Under the cover here, we have the classic Sierra Brownie yellowy box. The game comes on five three and a half inch 720 KB discs and three five and a quarter 1.2 megabyte discs. The manual is pretty dense and has a removable reference card in the middle, showing you the various keyboard, mouse, and joystick controls for different parts of the game. Next is a really cool comic book that introduces the story and doubles as an interrogation guide. It's also smattered with comic book style ads that might give you a chuckle. Banza, your cat. Finally, there's a 10th anniversary catalog that's actually pretty neat. It has some history on the Japanese games that Sierra published in North America, like Thexter, Silphied, and Sorcerian. I also had no idea that you could direct order hardware like Gravis joysticks and sound cards right from Sierra. It looks like by 1990, the Roland MT32 was discounted down to $400. Speaking of the MT32, this will be a great fit for AO46 and the Mister, so let's image the discs and try it out. So I got out my USB floppy drive to start imaging these Rise of the Dragon discs, and I get a Windows Defender notification, and it located and cleaned the stoned monkey B virus from this disc in 2021. Thanks, Windows. Okay, with all viruses cleaned, I'm playing the 16 color version here on Mr. and the AO486 core. You can see that they've made heavy use of dithering effects to make it look more colorful, but in any case, it has a lot of pixel art charm with its comic book styling. You could always just play the 256 color version too if you wanted a little more color depth. The story goes that the mayor's daughter is killed by a designer drug and you as William Blade Hunter, a private investigator, are given the case to track down the source. The gameplay is fairly standard for a point and click with a few quirks, but features an active time system to keep things moving. Apparently, you can talk yourself into unwinnable states, so saving often is important. Of particular note is the amazing Roland MT32 score with custom instruments and sound effects.
My favorite track is Blade's Apartment, obviously taking clues from the Vangelis Blade Runner soundtrack. Let's listen. I'll be playing this game through in a live stream coming soon. Subscribe with notifications so you don't miss it. Next is The Humans from Game Tech. Or is it Atari or Imagitech Design? This is a puzzle platformer from 1992, and it seems we have a CD-ROM release proudly emblazoned with a sticker on the front, and there's a sticker over the original specs. This game only requires a paltry 386, but I don't think CD-ROM drives are all that common with 386 machines. Sound support includes Roland, which usually means MT32. The manual is printed on thick cardstock and is mostly a review of all the different abilities your humans can use, but quite a few pages are just filled with bad puns. We also have a GameTech registration card, don't forget to check off whether you have a modem or not. There is also a basic installation reference card and the CD itself. This sounds like another slam dunk for Mr. and the AO486 core. This title is a colorful puzzle game reminiscent of Lemmings. You control several humans that can be assigned tasks, and you can switch between them one at a time to move around. This game has an Amiga sort of feel to it, which makes sense since it was originally released on that platform, before then being ported to the PC, and just about every other platform at the time. Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Atari Lynx, and Atari Jaguar. In this first level, you have to pile up three of your humans before the fourth can climb up and discover the spear. This PC version offers a Roland MT32 soundtrack, which is pretty nice. Jumping forward in time, we have South Park, the official PC game from Acclaim. 3D graphics and internet LAN multiplayer were all the rage in 1999, and this game has them both. The only thing of note from the box is that it's not really clear what the gameplay is about, but at least promises authentic voices from the show. Requirements are Pentium 2 266 or Pentium 200 CPU with a 3D accelerator and 32 megabytes of RAM. Unfortunately, nothing cool in the box. Interesting to see instructions for direct internet connection games though, as many people were gaining access to the internet around the time of the new millennium. This game should work nicely in my Dell XPS R400. Using the Dell Pentium 2 again here, while the installation went fine, it didn't recognize my Radeon 9250 video card as a valid driver, and played in a small software rendered window at a very low frame rate. I eventually figured out that the game installed DirectX 6, which predates my Radeon by too much, but installing DirectX 9.0c, the last version supported by Windows 98, allowed South Park to see the card and play in full screen at a good frame rate. Like most cartoon-based games of this era, the real fun is seeing a 3D implementation of a 2D world you already know. This is basically a first-person shooter, starting you off with snowballs to beat back a barrage of turkeys as you collect your friends and head to the Renaissance Fair. This game was not reviewed very well, and I don't think I'll be playing too much of it. Jumping ahead another few years, we have Indigo Prophecy, also known as Fahrenheit, from Quantic Dream in 2005, published by Atari. I was a big fan of Quantic Dream's Heavy Rain on PS3, being one of the only games I actually played all the way through on PS3, so I jumped at the opportunity to add the small box release to my collection. System requirements here are Pentium 3, 800 MHz, and 256 MB of RAM, a huge step up from the previous games featured in this video. Inside is an Atari branded cardboard box, but beyond that, we're firmly into the age where boxes were just less fun to unpack. The manual does include lyric sheets for featured songs by Theory of a Dead Man, and hilariously they forgot to update the recommended RAM beyond TBD. It also mentions that Nvidia Riva cards and Intel integrated graphics won't cut it. To install this game, we're going to have to jump way up to my Sony VAIO Pentium 4 machine. Jumping up to this Sony VAIO VGC RB40, I got really cheaply at a value village, maybe known as Savers to those in the US. This is a Pentium 4, 3 gigahertz, half gigabyte of RAM, but only integrated Intel graphics GMA 900, which this game specifically told me not to use. Oh well. During the installation process, a quiz pops up and asks you various demoralizing questions like how much garbage does New York produce per day and how long can the brain function if deprived of oxygen? It doesn't seem to have any impact on the game, maybe it's just meant to affect your mood going in, or maybe it's just a waste of your time during the 3-disc installation process. 
With the game started up, it seems I'm able to max out the graphics settings with these Intel integrated graphics, at least at 640x480. The introduction shows you that you are a serial killer being controlled by some malevolent force and you have to hide your tracks so you don't get found out before you solve the mystery of who or what is controlling you. For whatever reason, the controls are not well explained in the manual. You use the arrow keys to control your character, Lucas, and when facing an object that can be manipulated, actions appear at the top of the screen. You then click the left mouse button and move the mouse in one of the four directions indicated by those icons. These actions have a little timeline to them, so you can move forward and back through the action with the mouse. You're meant to run out of time and fail puzzles often so that you can go back and try again until you find out exactly what to do for the whole sequence. And that's how my story ends. Okay, that's all for today. Stay tuned for more mailbags in the future and watch for my Rise of the Dragon live stream coming to YouTube very soon. Until next time.